Welcome everyone. We're going to get started here in a minute. We invite you to share your name and where you're tuning in from in the chat. Got some folks coming in from New York, North Carolina and Missouri, South Carolina, Blacksburg, Germany. So we got some international folks here. It's always really fun to watch the chat and see who's joining us today. So thanks for sharing. We'll go ahead and get started. My name is Katie Trazo. I'm the coordinator of the Virginia Beginning Farmer and Rancher Coalition. I also coordinate the Virginia Tech Catawba Sustainability Centers Forest Herb Network. And I'm starting us off today on behalf of a number of partners, including Penn State, NC State, and the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition. And again, those who are just tuning in, we invite you to share your name and where you're tuning in from. I'm just going to start us off with a, some few technical logistics, and then I'll pass it on to our speakers for the day. First, uh, your line is automatically muted, and your video is not enabled. And that's uh, because we're in a Zoom webinar and not a Zoom meeting. So the main way you will be able to interface with us tonight is through the chat feature if you wanna share comments and through the Q&A feature if you'd like to pose questions to the speakers. We also wanna let you know that the session is being live captioned and there's an option for you to select viewing the captions by clicking the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom pane. You can see them in subtitles or in full transcript. And if it came up automatically, and you'd like to turn them off, you also can click that button. We also want to let folks know that the session is being recorded tonight and it will be archived on the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition's website. We'll also send out a link to everyone who's registered as well. So you'll be able to access that after the call. That'll be up in about a week. And if you're having any technical difficulties tonight, feel free to contact me in the chat, Katie Trazo. You're also welcome to email me at ketrazo at vt.edu. We got some great folks in the background helping with tech support and they're putting that in the chat now. So in case you need to reference it later, it will be there. So the Forest Farming in Focus series is a series of five webinars that we've been offering this winter. And they're designed to be really 201 conversations. So a deeper dive into forest farming species, topics and practices. We have created beginning learn learning modules on each topic and they're on the ABFFC website. So if you find that you're missing some 101 information, we recommend you go back to that module. And today is our fourth session. We're focusing on ginseng forest farming and we will have our 201 presentation going into a, into a lot of the details of, of ginseng forest farming. Then we'll have some farmer sharing and then we'll have time for questions from you all. And today we have Eric Burkhart from Penn State University, Ed and Carol Daniels of Shady Grove Botanicals, Anna Plattner and Justin Wexler of Wild Hudson Valley sharing today. And I'm gonna briefly introduce our speakers and then I'll pass it on to Eric Burkhart to give us the 201 presentation. So Eric's a botanist, ethnobotanist and agroforester at Penn State where he's director of, of the Appalachian Botany and Ethnobotany program at Shavers Creek Environmental Center. He's also an associate teaching professor in the ecosystem science and management department. His research and education program is focused on developing sustainable wild stewardship and agroforestry production systems for specialty forest products, including ginseng, also golden seal and ramps. Ed and Carol Daniels are forest and market farmers in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains in West Virginia. They were both born and raised in West Virginia. They began planting wild harvested American ginseng on their farm in the mid 1990s. Incorporated, incorporated other forest medicinals like golden seal, ramps, black cohosh, uh, and they continue adding other native plants to their properties. In 2016, they started a small business named Shady Grove Botanicals where they grow and sell starter kits to beginning forest farmers as well as several value-added products. They attend and present at forest farming conferences to increase and share their knowledge. 
Since 2016, Ed has been teaching the youth how to grow at-risk medicinals using sustainable and organic methods. Shortly thereafter, they incorporated vegetables into their program to teach kids how to grow their own food. This is how their nonprofit Plant the Seed project began. I'll move on to Anna Plattner and Justin Wexler and their forest farmers and educators in the Catskill Mountains and the Hudson Valley regions of New York State. Together they run Wild Hudson Valley, a small farm and educational organization that focuses on agroforestry and regional environmental and human history. Over the past 10 years, the couple has managed the planting of over 250 acres of wild simulated American ginseng through their work with the American Ginseng Farm, which is one of the largest forest farming projects in the United States. So thank you all for coming to share your expertise with us. It seems like we're in great hands to be learning, uh, going into more deep depth into ginseng forest farming. So with that, I'll pass it on to Eric Burkhart. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this evening and happy spring. Uh, I'm gonna kick things off as was mentioned. Um, <clears throat> I would promise that I would deliver some some content uh, as part of this webinar series, and uh, then we'll move on to some perspective uh, from people who are doing forest farming. Uh, this particular session is going to focus on the ginseng topics of site selection, pest management, and leaf harvest. Uh, and I'll preface all that by saying that uh, I'll only be talking for about 30 to 40 minutes, so that's a, a big tall glass of water to kind of get into here, but I'm going to do it because um, I'll move through a lot of stuff fairly quickly, uh, but we'll have plenty of time to hear from some of our uh, experienced forest farmers as well around these topics, as well as have some Q&A at the end. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. I'll just introduce myself uh, once again. Here's some contact information. Uh, I am on social media, uh, somewhat Instagram. If people are on there, you can find me on there and uh, programs like this are advertised there. And we're getting into uh, back into in-person season. So we've got some fun programs lined up for this year. And so if you're interested in staying in the loop, um, pretty much all of us on here have an Instagram site. So make sure you give us a follow uh, to stay in the loop. Uh, also, as part of the preparation for this session or as some review, uh, because we realize people have a variety of different uh, backgrounds and experiences with ginseng. Maybe some of you know very little and you're here just because you've heard about it and this is a good opportunity. Uh, there's some background resources. So you can go on the internet, of course, you can go on the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmers Coalition website and find plenty of resources. But uh, I was asked to suggest a couple of things as part of background for my session. And I'll just mention that uh, late last year, I did a couple of webinars that are recorded and are available and you should have received links for them. If you haven't looked at them, you can look at them a little bit later, but uh, one of them covers the basics of ginseng biology. So if you're brand new to ginseng and know nothing about how this plant grows and what it means to be a good stewardship of wild populations, I'd suggest this is a good resource to uh, check out. And then uh, the basics of forest farming are also covered in another webinar that I did this past fall uh, for Penn State Extension that again, you received a link to. So. Uh, if there's some gaps in your knowledge after you walk away from tonight, um, you might want to check out these particular webinars, which are recorded and in your possession. Finally, I'll mention uh, I also provided some links and on my website, which uh, Katie or Stesha just pushed out a few moments ago, you can find these extension publications that are downloadable PDFs for free uh, on my website that you can look at. And they're going to cover some basics of uh, forest farming of ginseng as well as wild collection. So some resources out there. This is just what I can point to from my own background, um, but a variety of expertise here on this webinar tonight and uh, organizing this webinar series. And so feel free to reach out if you've got questions and, and need further direction. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, we're talking about forest farming. So let's just start this with just a quick background to put us all on the same page. We're talking about an agroforestry practice. Uh, and forest farming is when we either introduce or manage wild populations on our forest lands, um, primarily because we have the right growing conditions, right? So many forests in Appalachia are well-suited to growing plants like ginseng. 
And so as I'm going to start out by talking about tonight, site selection is a very important feature of forest farming. In fact, of all the agroforestry practices, site selection is arguably probably the most important with forest farming, especially if you want to be successful at it. And so, uh, so we have a working definition. Here you go. Now, I'm going to just jump right into some details. So a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, that might sound familiar, uh, I was a student who studied ginseng across Pennsylvania. Um, and between 2002 and 2009, my goal was to help identify what we might consider good ginseng forest farming sites around the state of Pennsylvania. And so what I'm about to share with you, just a brief snippet of, uh, is the results of all over Pennsylvania, okay? And I wanna put it in the context of the fact that uh, Pennsylvania, as it turns out, has very similar site conditions to many areas of Appalachia for the growth of ginseng. In other words, what I'm going to review tonight is quite similar across the board. So while I'm gonna base my experience and, and uh, review of information from my own research in Pennsylvania, it is applicable, I think, in many other regions. And I notice many of you are coming from other regions. Uh, I'll also note that uh, the details of what I'm going to report are found in an academic paper that you can grab off my website as well. Um, and it's got some guidance for identifying forest farming sites, a little bit deeper than what we can get into tonight. But if anybody wants this resource, it's available. All right, so let's start with the number one question that I hear from everybody. What makes a good forest farming site for ginseng? Okay, so we want to try and figure out where to plant this stuff. And the first thing that people think of, of course, is soils. What kind of soils we're going to look at? And I'm not here to say that soils are not important, but I just want to kind of dispel a couple of things. The first thing I'm putting out here is uh, soil testing, as we typically use it uh, through a university source like Penn State, is not necessarily um, very useful in forest farming of ginseng. And the primary reason is that forest sites and forest soils are very heterogeneous in terms of their soils. They're not like agronomic fields that have been, you know, basically managed for uh, decades, if not longer, for certain crop production and, and have been limed and tilled and cover cropped and all kinds of things. Instead, in forested areas, we end up with little hot spots of production, what a lot of people refer to as honey holes or sweet spots in forest farming, especially with ginseng. Uh, and I just want to point out how you can waste money, essentially, doing soil testing if you're not careful for a part of uh, site evaluation. So this is a grower that came to me one time uh, and over from Western Pennsylvania and, and showed me this plant. And I literally took a picture of it. And he said, now what's wrong with this plant, Eric? It's got to be something wrong with this soil uh, because the rest of the plants were looking pretty good. So I pulled a soil sample and you can see the results of it down at the bottom, right? Soil pH, major macronutrients there and so on. Nothing too noteworthy to talk about. Let's just leave it at that for the moment. But I then went one foot away to where the healthy plants are and I pulled another soil sample and I submitted that to Penn State. So now we're in about $20 for two soil samples, okay? And you'll notice that when we look at the comparison of pH and nutrients, there's effectively no difference, okay? So what's going on here? Uh, these plants are responding to a lot of different things that oftentimes have nothing to do with soil pH or macronutrients, right? So soils, as I mentioned, are heterogeneous in forests. So they're oftentimes dictated on one side of the hill by you know, the aspect and, and the trees that are growing there versus the other side of the hill. And what that means is we can often have secondary metabolites coming from the foliage of the overstory trees that are leaching into the ground. We can have old rotten logs in one spot in the forest that are decomposing, whereas in other spots, they're not found. And so we have all these micro conditions that tie in with what makes a good site. And so I would say that from a soil testing standpoint, there's not much to be said about where to grow ginseng. So I put that out there because where we're going to go with this is that it's really about evaluating the site by appearances. We're going to look for indicators of site conditions, right? And specifically, we're going to look for overstory trees as well as understory plants. Okay, and kind of put a period on this. When you look across the state of Pennsylvania at all those sites that we've been studying, you see that something like soil pH varies considerably. It can be a low of 4.5 all the way up to a 6.4. Okay, and so you see it across the board. 
One of the things that might explain that is that we know that American ginseng has a symbiotic mycorrhizal relationship. So like many forest plants, it has these complicated relationships with other organisms that are found in the soil. And in the case of American ginseng, it's well established that there are fungi that are important to the growth, vigor, and survival of American ginseng. Okay, And so part of the variation can be explained by the fact that it's not just the soil chemistry that dictates where ginseng can grow. It's a lot of the biology and ecology of the soil and habitat as well. And so one thing to point out that I think I saw Bob Bifus jump on in a few moments that my friend Bob Bifus uh, pointed out years ago is that there does seem to be a correlation, if anything, with ginseng and calcium. And so specifically what we look for oftentimes is areas where limestone is a parent material, right? Um, so that's going to contribute a lot of calcium into the soil over time. And so when you look across a state like Pennsylvania, really the only notable uh, feature that we see associated with soil macronutrients is the calcium content. And we have quite a range of uh, variability there, but there's still this trend towards anywhere from 2000 or more pounds of calcium per acre, parts per million, however you wanna view it, okay? And so the bottom line is there is a, a well-established relationship that has been borne out, uh, especially with some of the trials from our neighbors to the North and Janine Davis, who's also on this, has written about this in her book, between calcium and American ginseng. And so if anything, we wanna pay attention to the indicators that is the vegetative indicators that tell us that we're looking at a site that has a lot of calcium or is derived from limestone. And so what does that mean? In a state like Pennsylvania, when we measured all the trees that are associated with ginseng, we found that 85 species of trees, shrubs, and vines are associated with the, the species, right? Healthy, vigorous, reproducing populations. Okay? That's a whole lot of species to sort through. And so when we sort through them, by the metric that I just mentioned, what are the dominant species that we find on these calcium rich sites? Across the range of ginseng, uh, in most states you find it at sugar maple. So one of the things we wanna establish is that good sites typically have a healthy component of sugar maple on them. In addition, historically we saw a lot of white ash. White ash is a known calcifite, as we say, it tends to grow on sites that are limestone derived and have a lot of calcium. The problem is, as many of you know, emerald ash borer, an exotic beetle, has taken out much of our white ash, so it can't be really relied on much anymore. So there are a couple other species that have fallen into its kind of place. One of them is American basswood, which in Pennsylvania is the third common species that we see with American ginseng, and tulip poplar, which often occurs with American ginseng. So people often ask, well, which types of trees do I look for? Okay. These are the big four, uh, in my experience, and again, scientifically across Pennsylvania and many other states, we see sugar maple, ash, basswood, and tulip poplar. But we need to marry that with the understory. If we pay attention to the understory, it's even more diverse in a state like Pennsylvania. We counted 143 different herb species and 16 different ferns associated with American ginseng across the state. So how do we tease that apart? Well, let me just give you a couple of clues. So the number one species that we saw was Jack in the pulpit. You can see it's found on 91% of our plots across the state of Pennsylvania. Now, the interesting thing about Jack in the pulpit as a so-called understory indicator is that Jack in the pulpit, while it does often co-occur, it's on the left here with American ginseng, is often noted from sites that have nothing to do with American ginseng. So for example, you can find Jack in the pulpit growing down on floodplains in sedge communities, as you can see here. You can find Jack in the pulpit growing up on sandstone ridges in areas that really are not supportive to ginseng, okay? And so we have to be careful. We pay attention to these understory and overstory trees that we're lining them up together. It's not one species that we wanna pay attention to. It's a combination of indicator species. And many of you, probably have a sense of what those indicator species are in your region. If you don't, you want to try and find wild ginseng populations if they're not already on your property, look around and note what the species are in your particular region. 
okay? Because the Sang habitat, as we say, is gonna be a combination of overstory and understory conditions lining up. In other words, sugar maples can be planted in someone's lawn, right? And we can plant jack in the pulpits in a nice shade garden, but it's not necessarily Sang habitat. So when we look for forest farming sites, and we choose these species, we want to make sure that we're looking at both overstory and understory species together. Now, one other species that I think is worth paying attention to that many people don't know about, but has a rich history of site selection or indicator value across Appalachia is a little fern, a little primitive fern, it's called rattlesnake fern. Okay, It's known as Botrychium virginianum. Now, why I point this one out is it was our number two plant in the state of Pennsylvania but it actually goes back much further than a Penn State study. Uh, this is a book from the 1900 era, and it's about ferns. And you'll notice that the entry on the left side says that this fern, which they're calling the grape fern, is an indicator of ginseng habitat. The tip of the frond always points towards a ginseng plant. They call it sang sun. Okay. And so in 1900, they were noting in these fern books that actually some of the ginseng hunters had noted that this is a good indicator for ginseng. Furthermore, if we look in places like the American Journal of Folklore, this is from 1894, you find people recorded this as sang sign or sang fern because they thought that its growth indicated the presence of ginseng. Okay. So if we put all this together, you know, there's a lot of species that co-occur with ginseng, but here in the northern part of the range, the ones that we tend to look for include those overstory species I mentioned, sugar maple, tulip poplar, historically white ash and basswood. And then I pair that together with jack in the pulpit, also known as Indian turnip, and sang sign or sang fern here in the understory. And uh, it hasn't failed me yet in terms of introducing seeds in the state of Pennsylvania. Typically, uh, if we line those things up, we get ginseng to grow. Now let's move from there into how we're going to grow this stuff. Okay, so many of you know that uh, there's a variety of different ways that we can grow ginseng on a good site once we've located one. When we talk about forest farming, this is the vision I think that most people have. It's an unfortunate vision in the sense that farming suggests that we're taking our rototillers and our equipment in the forest all the time and we're, you know, we're plowing it like the back 40 and we're going to plant this stuff dense and spray it with things and, and, and that sort of thing, you get the idea. Uh, but forest farming is a much more diverse practice than this, okay, and it need not be this intensive. In fact, most people that are doing forest farming that I work with don't do this at all. Okay. So this brings up this issue of the different strategies for growing ginseng in the forest. Now, again, this is a little bit of a one-on-one, -on -one, so we won't go too deep here, but suffice it to say that we can do everything from managing wild populations through replanting of seeds and moving plants around to introducing more seed and more propagation material. We call that wild simulated, but doing very, very little else to something that's a little more intensive, like I just showed you, woods grown, which means that we're gonna do some fairly intensive manipulation of the site conditions in many cases. So let's talk about that. In that context, there's this kind of idea within permaculture, which some of you may be familiar with, of how we go about planting. And so this ties together very nicely. We think about woods cultivated ginseng, we're often thinking about what you see on the left, monocultural production. We're going to make beds. We're going to get rid of most the other things that are growing in the understory. We're going to dedicate that area to ginseng. That's certainly a possibility, and people do do that. And I'll talk about that more in just a moment. But we also have some other options that we want to put in our toolkit. In the middle, you can see we have companion planting, right? And companion means that we're taking multiple species and planting them in the same area, or at least not removing them. So plants like golden seal, which oftentimes are associated with ginseng populations, we're going to mix them together in the forest understory, okay? And that can get multiple benefits when we start to talk about pest management in just a few moments, okay? And so the idea here is really one of disease resistance, right? Or building up some sort of um, ability for the site to not turn into essentially a big disease field. 
So what you see here is a very intensive woods grown operation uh, that basically deals with a lot of disease each and every year. That disease has to be sprayed or the plants don't survive. Okay, we have things like alternaria that can come in and create uh, losses to the tops of the plants in particular. We also have things like Phytophthora, which is a fungal disease that can move in the water that's moving through uh, the, the soil or just passively through moving you know, spores across the soil surface in the organic matter. These diseases, once they get going in many forest farms, uh, you oftentimes can't get rid of them. And so you may have heard about, or maybe some of you have experienced the fact that people say that you can't replant ginseng in the same area. Okay, the disease builds up too much. This is often associated with more intensive modes of production, just like we see in field production. So the more we push ginseng into monocultural production, the more we get disease outbreaks. And it's a very important then thing to note because our strategy and our approach needs to be one that's cognizant that the more we pack these things in here, the more we're gonna set ourselves up for, for heartbreak potentially. So really what we're gonna focus on is polyculture. And I'm gonna spend the next few minutes just walking you through what I mean by this. But the short story is in a quick visual is once again, we're combining species in the forest understory, or at the very least, we're not removing everything so that we can plant only ginseng. Okay, we're gonna try and maintain some of the diversity of that understory. And guess what? In the case of golden steel and black cohosh, these are also valuable forest herbs with their own markets and market potential. And so maintaining that polyculture not only gets us you know, a little bit further in an integrated pest management standpoint, but it also allows us to balance our risk, right? Build resilience by having more crops in the forest understory than just ginseng. And so let me introduce you to a couple of characters. Uh, these are a couple of guys I work with up here in Pennsylvania. Cliff is on the left, Randy's on the right. Um, and I'm going to walk you through their operation, and it's a fairly diverse polycultural operation, although you would never hear these guys utter the word polyculture out of their mouth at all. So here's how they start. They go into a forest that they've identified using site indicators, things like we've just talked about, and they start to think about site improvements that can be made. And in this regard, I'm not talking about tillage and things of that nature. I'm talking about are there invasive shrubs and things in there that need to be removed or taken under control? In this process, we might do a little bit of forest management. So that's beyond where we wanna go here, but I just wanna point out that if you don't know anything about managing your forest or interpreting the ecology of what's going on in your forest, it's a good idea to start to educate yourself or to reach out to a service forester that's available in your state and get someone in there to help you interpret what's going on. At what stage of development are you managing this forest? What are your goals? What's your species composition? All those sorts of things. In the process of doing that, I just want to point out that Anna and Justin, as they're going to hear about uh, in New York, had someone actually collect data um, on ginseng on their sites and found that in site management, managing light was the most important consideration that they found. In other words, it's not a bad thing to go in and start to thin out trees. We have to be cautious and we have to think about the composition and how much light we're putting on the forest floor. But it's a little bit of a misleading idea to think that just because this grows in a forest that it requires super dense shade. In fact, it doesn't. Much of that thinning that we do, by the way, we would call waste wood can be used in a variety of different ways. We can use it in other forest farming endeavors, biomass for shiitake logs, as you see one of our ginseng growers doing here. Okay, And as I'll talk about, many of the growers will actually just lay it down on the ground like this. So this is Randy and Cliff once again, and this is how they go about their management. They go in, they identify good crop trees. Uh, it doesn't hurt that Randy does logging on the side and works for a mill. So he's good at identifying trees and good crop trees. And he's identifying trees that wanna stay, right? The, the good trees, the healthy trees, um, things that can be spaced out, right? That's why we call them crop trees. You'll notice on the right side at about three o'clock, we've got a little stump there. 
Okay, so that's one that was recently thinned. And you can see that some light is being set down into that little gap there. Now there is a lot of ginseng in there. It may not look like it. It doesn't look like that pretty picture that I was just putting up showing those nice neat rows of forest farm ginseng. Okay, and so you kind of have to move beyond that mindset of, you know, that we're in conventional horticultural crops and we're trying to grow rows of big fat plants, okay? What you can see here is that these guys, when they remove that overstory and thin it, they lay down the tops. This is where our future biomass is gonna come from. This is where our nutrients are locked up. And as we'll talk about, this can also prevent some of the pests that are gonna plague us. So here come little plants, little ginseng plants up through that kind of slash. They grow just fine up through all that biomass. Uh, in fact, in some cases, they're protected by a lot of the biomass. So even though it doesn't look like there's ginseng underneath these blackberries, it's all through there, okay? And if you know what ginseng looks like in this particular picture, you can see what I mean. So this is a diverse understory. And there's at least, I'm looking at a dozen, maybe 15 or more plants, three prongers in particular, that are in this particular photo. By the way, you can see a tulip poplar at about 11 o'clock coming up. Okay, so this is what we mean by a polyculture, maintaining the diversity of the understory while making sure that your ginseng is not being overrun by things like invasive shrubs. How do you find the ginseng? Well, it turns yellow for you, right? So uh, these guys just wait for late season and it starts to show up for them, right? So you just look for the yellow out through your ginseng patch and there it is, okay? Now let's get into some of the management that they do. So they identify a site, they prep it a little bit just by uh, managing some of the overstory. They put a lot of that biomass down, they seed it and they allow it to grow up through. What's the fence for Eric? For deer in this particular case. So maybe some of you are dealing with deer problems. There's a number of different options that we can deal with uh, that you know, will help. Of course, if you have enough income, and these guys uh, in their ginseng operations have uh, gotten enough income that they've fenced a lot of their area to keep the deer out. But there are other cheaper options. Okay? So deer can come in, it's not a preferred plant, but they can create a problem for you. Many of you probably have experienced this. One of the things that leaving that slash on the ground does is create a nice little barrier for deer. So, uh, a, almost a fail safe kind of mechanism in my experience, as well as the growers I work with like Randy and Cliff, is if you've got deer problems and you don't necessarily want or can't afford to put up a deer fence, create a low tech fence by creating these so-called slash walls or laying the tops of the, the trees that fall down across your ginseng patch or around it. And you can see that the ginseng does just fine as long as it's not too dense. Another strategy uh, from Western Pennsylvania, this is from Barry Wolf's property. There's a lot of ginseng in here and you might not notice it. And that's because it's growing in amongst this plant. This is some impatience or some jewelweed. You might recognize jewelweed as being a weed of open areas, particularly wet areas. But in many parts of Appalachia, it will come in, especially to these areas that the canopy has opened up as a small plant. It may not get very big, and in many locations, it can actually provide cover for ginseng. And the reason is, is that in much of the range, this is preferred deer food. So we can kind of bait the, the deer away from the ginseng by providing food that they prefer. And so this has been a strategy that many growers have employed here in, in Pennsylvania as well, putting slash down and then making sure that they introduce things like jewelweed or manage for jewelweed in their patches so that the deer have something else to eat. Other things beside deer that come in, however, include things like this little bugger. And this is a picture I took one day as I was uh, sitting in a patch, just trying to figure out what was eating the seeds. On the left side, you can see that there's a ginseng inflorescence that's been chewed off. In the lower picture, you can see that there's the remnants of the seed coat. And as I sat there for about 45 minutes, I heard something scurrying around, along in the leaf litter. And lo and behold, it's that little cute thing right there. That little cute thing is called a jumping woodland mouse. It's called a jumping mouse because it will jump onto the plants. It'll climb up 
and either chew off the inflorescence and drop it to the ground where it'll feed below the plant, or it'll chew the seeds off. And as you can see, the remnants you'll notice are laying on top of the soil or on top of the leaves. Okay. Along with that, we have uh, woodland voles. Uh, and voles can come through and clean out your roots. So we've got these kind of rodents that once they become established in a ginseng patch can either go after the seeds or the roots. And uh, I often like to comment because I don't think that this is an accident, although it's chuckle worthy. Most of the research that's been done with ginseng in a lab using rats, trying to identify what the benefits of ginsenicides are, have noted that particularly in rats, you have higher litter numbers associated with ginseng, ginseng consumption. So there seems to be this potential at any rate for this feedback loop that once these rodents get going in your ginseng patch, they're feeding on the seeds, they're feeding on the roots, and yes, they're consuming ginsenicides, which are having beneficial effects on the rodents. And it's the experience of many people that the problem then only gets worse. And so when we return to Cliff and Randy, that's been their experience. The only thing that they found that has helped has been cats in the woods. Um, and so this is not something that we can widely recommend just because cats can have undesired effects on, let's say, songbirds and other types of um, critters that you might want in your forest. But for them in a fenced in area, uh, this has cut down tremendously with some of the heavy predation areas that uh, they've been experiencing tremendous losses from. Okay? So many people are trying to be creative when it comes to the rodents. Some people have to abandon their sites altogether. There's no real easy solution to this. Other things that might become a problem for you include things that are native things that we like to look at. Wild turkeys will come through. There's a crop on the right side. Okay? Wild turkeys will come through and they will feed on the berries and the seeds. They don't necessarily kill the plants, but if you're looking to get a seed crop, this can become a problem. How do you deal with turkeys? Well, uh, most people just hunt them. Um, trigger warning, uh, Eastern chipmunks also like your seeds. And so after you start planting them, they will come in and they'll start feeding on them. This picture actually is courtesy of Bob Life is from, I believe it's Anna and Justin's operation. Um, and so this becomes a problem. As you start seeding in, you start to get these rodents coming in and eating your seeds. So it's an important thing to note that we are trying to grow a crop in the forest and all of these native critters that also belong in the forest can be problematic. They aren't always problematic, but they can be. And so anything that you can imagine that comes creeping along the forest in somebody's forest farm sometimes becomes a problem. Final thing I want to talk about to lead us off tonight is this business of leaf harvesting. So you all probably recognize that at a minimum we're waiting five years for ginseng to mature to something that we can harvest as a root. And more commonly, it's going to be 10 years or more. So there's been some research that's come out in recent years looking at ginsenicides, which are considered to be the active constituents in ginseng, okay, looking at ginsenicides in the foliage of the plant. And this is really kind of a, an area of research that we're going with a lot of these Appalachian forest plants, which is to say that it's whole plant medicine. It's not just the roots, it's the tops as well. In this particular case, you'll see in this study from North Carolina, they found that the ginsenicides that were found in the leaf tissue was actually higher in some cases than the roots. And so it does point to the fact that these are a potentially renewable source of ginsenicides for personal use, but also there is a growing market for them now as well. And so uh, you may have heard of a program now managed by United Plant Savers, but originally started here in Pennsylvania called the Forest Grown Program. Randy and Cliff have been selling their leaf material since 2014 uh, to Mountain Rose Herbs on the West Coast through this program. They're getting a good price for their leaf, and it's a, it's a product that otherwise would be wasted, if you will, right? Uh, if they're not consuming it, and they can't consume big boxes of this stuff, uh, it just goes back into the soil. Now, you know, we won't necessarily call that a waste, but there is medicinal potential to be harvested from the leaves. And so people have found increasingly that there are strong markets for leaf material. 
I mention this because while we're waiting five or 10 years to get our first crop of roots, this represents a good strategy for making some income. The problem with this that we haven't resolved is that how much of an impact does removing the foliage have on the root growth? And there's no answer to that just yet. So I'll just share with you in my final moments here what Randy and Cliff do. You can see on uh, the left prong at about nine o'clock, there are three little leaflets that have been sniffed off of that, uh, that prong. So what they typically do is just harvest a few leaflets from each of their plants each year uh, with the understanding that the plant needs those leaves, right? Those are the photosynthetic organs. Uh, and so we don't necessarily wanna take all of them. In fact, we wanna leave most of it intact. Uh, and that's the conservative stance right now. It may be that we, we can take half of those leaves, but that research just has not been done. And so that's a question that people are asking about right now with leaf harvests is how much can I take? And the answer is we don't know. So it's best to just be conservative and don't remove all of the aerial portions, certainly, but it's probably best to remove less than half of it as a conservative measure. So with that, I'm gonna wind it down there. I've put a lot on the table to talk about, and I'm gonna transition over to Anna and Justin, and they're gonna introduce themselves, their operation, and touch on some of these points and, and how they deal with it as well. Hi, everyone. Let me just share my screen. Oh, they couldn't hear you. Hello, I'm just sharing my screen. So I'm Anna and this I'm is Justin. Justin. <laughs> uh, so we're here representing Wild Hudson Valley tonight. Um, but we kind of, we're coming at, at this from kind of two approaches. On our farm at Wild Hudson Valley, we grow wild simulated ginseng, but we grow a lot, a lot more than just ginseng. We do log grown mushrooms, uh, golden seal, and a variety of other plants as well. Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, you basically covered everything. Like we, yeah, we, we do a wide range of most primarily native medicinal plants as well as traditional Eastern woodlands food crops. Um, and it, that, that's fairly small scale. It's, we're primarily educational. Um, yeah, our main product are our wild harvest boxes. So we oh, do yeah. a, a CSA of primarily foraged, but also forest farmed uh, foods. It's about once a month up here. And we're again in the Hudson Valley in New York. Um, but we also have a lot of experience growing wild, wild simulated ginseng through our role managing American Ginseng Farm, uh, where we grow 250 acres of ginseng. Um, and it's throughout the Catskill Mountains and a bit into the Hudson Valley as well. So we do wild simulated production. Eric mentioned uh, woods grown. Um, and what, we're, what our operation looks like is a lot like that picture on the left. Um, our ginseng plants are growing in and amongst uh, other companion plants. Many of them are indicator plants that Eric pointed out. Um, I always have to mention Bob here, who I know is tuning in tonight. Um, Bob was instrumental in starting American Ginseng Farm and uh, was really has really been a mentor to us in the ginseng world. Um, but our ginseng is still pretty young. Uh, the first year that we planted ginseng uh, was 2012, and we really want to be waiting at least eight years to harvest um, in a wild simulated setting, just because the, the roots are still very, fairly small, the plants grow uh, slower in a wild simulated setting than they might in an artificial shade cloth or a woods grown setting. And up on the, the picture on the, on the top right, those are six year old roots that we harvested um, from American Ginseng Farm. Some of them are fairly large, some of them are still pretty small and we're gonna wait uh, in, to harvest those. But just to give you an idea of what we do. And Eric talked a lot about site selection. And, and so I thought I'd touch base on a few of the things that he talked about. Um, we do take soil samples uh, before we plant an area. We, we primarily look at the calcium to make sure it's above that 2000 pounds per acre. 
Um, but we're also looking at some, a few other things, the calcium to magnesium ratio, ratio and the pH around 5.5. And this is really just to get a basis um, from of the site. Like Eric said, there's a lot of uh, different like micro habitats throughout the a mountainside. Um, and so we're, we make sure to take a few different sam soil samples in that sort of start to represent the different habitats that we're growing in. Um, up here in New York, we, we are looking primarily at sugar maple, um, basswood, and white ash. We actually don't have any tulip poplar on any of our ginseng sites. We're just that far north. Um, but uh, what were you going to say? Well, I, I was just going to throw in, you know, in, in terms, and you really don't need, to, so we're doing these soil tests as much as anything, just out of our own curiosity, because we keep, um, you know, very meticulous records so that we know exactly what's going on where. And honestly, any of the indicator plants mentioned already by Eric, um, for the, you know, a few of them in particular really tell you pretty much all you need to know about whether the growing conditions are suitable for wild simulated ginseng. And, you know, as the name defines it, you're growing, you're simulating how ginseng would be growing in the wild when you're planting. So the number one plant we look for is wild American ginseng, but other plants like rattlesnake fern, um, maiden hair fern, both of which are pictured on the bottom right, um, red and white baneberry, those are all great plants that are showing you that everything from, uh, you know, the various conditions in the soil are also suitable for ginseng, whether that be in terms of the different proportions of minerals, pH, moisture level, um, and also one big one that I feel like doesn't get talked about often enough is partially decomposed like organic matter. So a nice fluffy, you know, broken down, broken down leaves detritus. We find that ginseng and plants that also like ginseng habitat tend to grow in forests that have seen minimal disturbance. And by disturbance, I mean um, in our area, which is true for much of Eastern North America, a lot of land was pasture at some point in the past 300 years. Maybe it was pasture for 20 years, maybe it was pasture for 150. Ever since then, it may have returned to woods. The understory might be great. It might be sugar maple and ash dominated or tulip poplar or walnuts or basswood. But um, until it's had a time to really recover and for the soil to return back to more natural old growth conditions, um, we've found that the ginseng often does not do well. The ginseng we plant does not do well in it. And you, rarely find, at least in our neck of the woods, you rarely find wild ginseng growing in what otherwise look like good woods, but the soil is, was just that much impacted 50 or 100 years ago by sheep or cows or other livestock. Just a little side thing. Yeah, so. um, we've learned from experience that this is true. We've had entire half acre plantings do very poorly because there had been cows within the last 50 years. Um, another thing to mention are uh, earthworms. So uh, we have also had experience where we've planted in that soil where it looks a lot like coffee grounds because there have been invasive worms. The jumping worms. Jumping worms, the lumbricus terrestrius, the really giant like night crawlers. Um, and we've had very poor germination in that area, um, in those areas. Like in one case, one plant. <laughs> In like a quarter of an acre. Um, so that's just another consideration if you have a lot of earthworms on your site um, is to be wary. Uh, at, from planting 250 acres, we've gotten a really great idea of where to plant and where not to plant. Um, and, and when we're looking at a whole hillside, uh, we might only plant uh, certain spots along it. We're not going to come into a property and say, oh, this soil sample looks good. Let's plant like this whole area. There might be areas that are too wet within that um, and areas where uh, there's been prior logging, where there, there's compaction of the soil. And so, you know, you're rarely gonna plant a solid half acre. It's gonna be like smaller parts within that half acre, for example. And that's, that's what we mean by having planted 250 acres. We're not talking about contiguous acres, that's 250 acres of sometimes actually really small patches or gardens of ginseng, 250 acres over actually thousands of acres, um, right. you know, of either leased or 
own land. So um, it's, yeah, you're really looking for those micro habitats. It's very rare that we're able to plant ginseng um, in an area larger than two acres. We're, we're talking typically- Yeah, like none of our plots of are over two and a half acres. No. Um, in size of contiguous planting. Um, Eric mentioned light, and yes. that's a really big one for us. Um, he mentioned that uh, we had a student come and, and actually do a research uh, paper using our sites, and, and his name is Karim Chaban, and he, in his paper, he showed that uh, light was the, the most important indication of the survival of ginseng over time, because he looked at our areas, which were five years old at that time, um, which we had already noticed anecdotally. Um, and we started to do a lot of thinning. So uh, in the, the largest picture here, you can see that there's dappled sunlight coming through this entire hillside, but in some areas, it's still fairly shaded. So we would come through an area like that and actually take uh, generally smaller trees, less than a foot in diameter and uh, lay them down to open up a little bit more light in there and make ginseng grow twice as fast as it otherwise would. Um, we generally do the majority of our cutting after we plant ginseng because that brush then lays on the ground covering the seeds that we just planted and helping our, our ginseng seedlings then uh, make sure that they're not getting eaten by deer. Um, or because we're removing the leaf litter and then putting it back on, leave, the leaf litter can on a windy day start to blow away and the brush helps uh, in, in that regard as well. And it keeps turkeys from scratching on your seed after you've planted it as well. Um, Chipmunks have been a problem for us. Eric showed those pictures of the chipmunk with, uh, that was no longer living with the seeds coming out of its mouth. Uh, one time I, I put my bag of ginseng seed down and went and ate lunch and came back and the chipmunk had chewed a hole in it and there were no more seeds in there. Um, that chipmunk had 34 seeds in its mouth at one time. And you can imagine how many trips it might've been making throughout the day. So laying, making sure that your seeds are covered with a good amount of leaf litter, say like two to four inches, and then and not laying, much. not too much because you don't want to impact the seeds ability to germinate and send that little tiny, tiny seedling up through the leaf litter. Um, but then laying down brush on top of that to hold it in place, um, we found is really helpful. And if you wait till after you plant to do that, then you don't have to drag the brush out of there in order to plant. Um, so I think that's it for site selection. And then the other thing that Eric touched on is leaf harvest. So we have been doing that on our farm for about four years now, once our plants get to be three prongs is when we, we do this leaf harvest. And um, with Wild Hudson Valley here, we, we actually use the ginseng leaves in a tea blend where we mix it with nettle and, and other adaptogenic herbs. Um, and so Eric mentioned research, uh, that there hasn't been research on the uh, long-term effect of taking leaves, as you can see here, we are generally taking the whole top of the plant and we wait until late August or early September to do so. Um, generally by early August uh, up here in New York, the apical bud for next year's top has already formed. And so by, by cutting the entire plant off, um, at that time, in theory, you're not actually impacting that plant's ability to have a top for the next year. Um, it may affect the size of the top. We're not, I mean, we haven't noticed any impact, but again, that's anecdotal and we'd love to see some research done on this. Come, come do it on our farm. <laughs> it's tricky because, you know, one of the reasons we're harvesting the tops is not just for sale for our tea blends, but that is the number one method to prevent theft. Um, the majority in our area, there aren't as many diggers as in other parts of the country, but they're around. And, you know, I know people will go out in June or July, which is illegal and harvest ginseng. Um, and so we can't do much about them, but for the legal diggers coming in September, 
we do try to harvest the tops as late as possible in the season, but get it done before the before theft can become a real problem. And I mean, once the tops are gone, yeah, you'll see a few, you know, little ginseng seedlings here and there, but nobody's digging them anyway. And it's it is a very effective method for hiding, concealing your ginseng. Yeah. Um, so there's our contact info there. Um, and uh, oh, you should stop. We'll talk. Oh yeah, one thing. So so ginseng, uh, stem, the main stem on a ginseng plant. We've found that if you dry that and and use it for a tea blend, the stems tend to have sharp edges that actually can cut through tea bags and make for a really poor quality product. Um, so the stems end up being sort of a byproduct, but because they do have a lot of ginsenicides. This year, we, we decided to tincture, make a tincture with the stems, and we're happy to report that it, it's very potent. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> it, it tastes as strong so, as root tincture, and it's entirely stems. So, so the leaves and the, the small leaf stems can be used for the tea blends, and then the, the larger main stems could be used for tinctures as another value-added product. So that's it. I'll turn it over to Ed and Carol. Good evening. My name is Ed Daniels. This is my wife, Carol. Uh, we uh, are the proud owners of Shady Grove Botanicals. Uh, we're nestled here in the mountains, Appalachian Mountains, West Virginia. Uh, we do grow uh, at-risk medicinals as ginseng, uh, golden seal, cohosh, uh, both black and blue, and some various other roots and herbs, uh, wild yam and things. So and my wife, she takes on the, the project of making a lot of end products, uh, salves and oils, and does a lot of tinctures from the roots and such. And uh, so together, we uh, both plant. Uh, we go out on occasions and dig wild uh, ginseng in season and uh, other off roots and bring back to our farm to start um, small, small gardens. Um, not all monocropped. We try to build a, a diverse ecosystem out of some of this stuff. So um, we also want to be very sustainable as we go back and harvest these. So we've got a mix of roots as we plant, some old, some, some young. And uh, we let a lot of the old go as long as we can because we eventually would like to host or be hosted as a West Virginia seed bank. And um, just small Small things like that, uh, back to the folks talking about using the, the tops. Very good idea. We practice the same. Um, hadn't done the tincture, though, on the stems. That's new. I, I appreciate you, that, that you shared that. Uh, we do a lot with the berries, and uh, that's something that I haven't really got into selling. We've got a few friends that use it. Uh, the berry juice, uh, what a boost of energy, more so, I think, than the root. Um, we don't get a lot to um, put out per year, maybe a, a quart, but um, we, we do enjoy that. And uh, that's something that I think uh, far better than any energy drink we've ever tried. <laughs> you want to add something? Um, one of the things I want to tell you about today, why I got you here instead of just going to the pictures, um, got some product. This is uh, a tincture that we've had for about five years. It's a very old root, a um, couple roots there actually, but uh, this is how we make our tincture. Just bottle it up in an alcohol vodka form and let's set um, four or five years. You'll see the color change in that. Um, but you can also see how big that root is. Now, this jar contains ginseng that uh, has been dried. And um, it don't look so big. There's a couple in there that's, fairly large, but um, they was all at least this size, if not bigger. So the shrinkage, it's, it's pretty huge, like 3.5, I think, um, to one. Um, but after we dry that ginseng, we powder it. And we've experimented in the last year with the capsules and um, got a few people that's used them and have continued to use them. I use them every day. 
300 milligrams. Uh, I take two capsules per day. And um, we're, we're a small generator, so we have a little encapsular table uh, that does 100 capsules at a time. So a lot of time involved, a lot of hands-on. But um, we make a nice little end product, 30 capsules in that little jar, at 300 milligrams. Um, it's been going off pretty well. And the uh, shelf life's pretty good on that. Not have to buy alcohol or go to a local distillery to um, purchase that. Um, you know, sometimes that when it's hard to find sugars and such could get expensive to make alcohols. Mm -hmm. um, doing it this way, we found that it might be a, a little bit easier, a little more sustainable in our business to make the revenue that we want to without having to do the volume of routes that a lot of people do. So, um, Maybe smaller is better, and we want to keep our business to where it's just her and I. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's something that's fun. Uh, we enjoy each other's time, and um, sometimes whenever you hire a bunch of employees to do things that's a little larger, you lose your quality. And our name's behind Shady Grove Botanicals, and that's what we want to get out there. And uh, we're happy to be here involved in everything. Uh, a lot of good folks here. That shared their knowledge um, and over the years, not just this evening, over the years. And um, a lot of people that's watching out there have probably been at a conference and met, but I haven't. But um, I didn't learn all this on my own. And my wife and I have gathered a lot of information from attending things like this. And not only in our state, but other states. So it's good to get involved, get out there. The main thing is plant the seed. You know, we've got time to get another crop of ginseng in our lifetime. So we're planting as much as we can, uh, both seeds and roots. We do buy roots from um, wild foragers, wild harvest. And we select some of those bigger roots to plant at our farm because those are big uh, seed producers. And everything that we do is uh, dug by a dipple bar, uh, one root at a time. Uh, that method is um, to keep the characteristic of the root as wild as we can. If we transplant it and put it in loose tilled soil, it's going to change its characteristics. It'll still be a ginseng plant, and maybe the genetics will be the same, but it won't have the same look. So uh, we try to follow through to make things like that to hold the value of our product. And uh, the appearance sometimes at the market is very important. Um, just, just the same as the damaged root versus a, a perfect uncut root that has a lot of hair follicle on it. You know, uh, as a buyer, we look at quality. Uh, sometimes a root that's gnawed on by a molar of old that's lived after that for a couple of years, the market looks for things like that because they say the ginseng plant, as it healed itself, it made it stronger. So in the market, Sometimes those folks see that and we might think it's trash, but they're looking at it as something of value. So maybe they know more than us because I think uh, the Asian markets used uh, ginseng for close to 5,000 years. And uh, with good intentions, we, we wish we could continue to do so if we plant the seed and get more product out there and more, more items growing. Uh, not only with ginseng, but other medicinals. Uh, here in West Virginia, we don't have a lot of herb producing companies, um, root buyers, but it shows in just a few years of over harvest for the ramps. And we raise ramps. And um, if you go into the woods, a lot of places, it's getting really scarce to find them. So, you know, uh, I was looking out to find ramp seed and found out they're like $500 a pound. Well, yeah. Maybe I should just harvest them, leave the ramps alone. I don't know, but uh, there's there's a lot of seed in a pound of ramps. I think it was 34,000 to 44,000. So it's a lot of seed for $500, but it takes seven years for it to produce a lot. Same as a ginseng. So everything goes back to we need to plant and encourage everybody, your neighbor. We give out seeds a lot, um, not so much to to sell them, but to get them out there to young people to grow it. Because if you get them started in it and they're watching it, next thing you know, they're taking pictures of it and they're sharing it on Facebook and more people will grow. We want more people to grow. So um, our products, 
we know uh, are all pure. We, we compete in the market with people who sell other supplements, but uh, we've noticed that their prices are cheaper. They have a lot of fillers. Um, our products, we, um, we're happy to say they're 100% organic and above. Uh, we consider ourselves organically grown. Uh, we use things such as golden seal, uh, a, a fresh golden seal root, say 25 of them, cut them up, put them in some uh, spring water or, or distilled water and set them in the sun for a week. Um, that's our method to spray to fight off fungal diseases and such. Um, take another root, uh, a little yarrow, help the fence of the deer. You know, it, it takes a little bit to, to make these um, potions or sprays up, but uh, in the long run, it's the best of the best. Uh, if you need to avoid the deer and, and other fungal things, you know, if you look around, there's probably a root or herb that'll help you do so. And if you use them, then, you know, I, to me, you're above being uh, certified organic or organically grown. And that's, that's our method here in West Virginia. Yeah, well, I guess Carol brought up a good point. Our, our farm does consist of a lot of maple. Uh, we have a few sugar maples, uh, a lot of small maples. Actually, our closest neighbor uh, started the Maple Surf Festival in Pickens, West Virginia, 36 years ago. And he has a sugar shack and a process facility right below us. And, um, you know, we're up around 3,700 feet. So if you know anything about ginseng, the higher in elevation, the darker the, the root more value in that so um, we were lucky to get the place we have and um, to be into what we're into uh, our mountain farm is really we don't grow any vegetables at our mountain farm we have a, a farm here in the valley that we run all of our vegetables through so our mountain farm is a true mountain farm it's it's in the mountains and uh, we're happy that uh, we have all these um, medicinals and uh, roots and herbs to uh, watch we take a lot of pictures and enjoy that as a couple and we invite folks out. We do some classes and teach kids there as well. And um, we hope that uh, one day we'll have a small summer college going with the uh, community of Helvetia. That's it for me. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, folks. Uh, so it's back to me. I'm going to moderate the rest of the session here. And uh, there's been some questions that have been coming in. I've been trying to kind of field those. Uh, so if you have additional questions, uh, feel free to put those in the Q&A at this point, And I'll try and make sure that they get lumped together a little bit uh, so that we can tackle. Uh, one of the things that came up that I'll just mention um, that a number of people commented on was this whole issue of, of theft, right? Human poachers, right? Mm -hmm. So as Bob Bifa says, uh, it's really not poaching, it's theft. Um, and I 100% agree. And we have to start using the right terminology. Um, so, you know, that often scares people off. Uh, I've dealt with it here in central Pennsylvania. I know many growers that have been established for a while have had some incidences uh, we work with law enforcement to try and educate them around this issue, but I'm curious what your experience with theft is and um, what it is that you might do. One of the things that was mentioned um, that people have asked about some clarity on was this pinching of tops. Uh, my experience here in Pennsylvania has been that by the time we get to about August 1st in most years, you can check out the rhizome and you'll see that there's a bud that's set there. Uh, and as long as those seeds are mature and that bud is set, there doesn't seem to be a problem with removing the foliage. And, uh, you know, the bonus there is, is that the foliage is oftentimes still green and usable, right? Uh, so thoughts about that? What, what are you dealing with with theft and what's your management and what do you look for when you pinch the tops? Anna? Yeah. <laughs> So for, for us, we've been pretty fortunate that we haven't had any major theft problems at the farm yet. Um, we've taken a lot of precautions. So we have uh, cameras and scary signage up at any areas on the property where trails come in, even if they're like on the other side of the property, not near a road. Um, we have posted signs all the way around and then at trail junctions, we have trail cameras um, and, and scary signage. 
Um, we have cameras that uh, connect to our phone so that when a picture is taken, we get a notification right away. We don't have to wait until we can go check the game camera footage to see. Um, if, if there is somebody coming in the property or if it's just the 10,000th deer um, of the day. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but uh, we also, like I said, any areas where we have a lot of more mature plants, and um, we do try to, as soon as uh, late August comes around, come through and, and cut those tops back. We try to push that as late as we can. Um, you know, so in areas where there might be less theft pressure, we maybe wait a little few days into ginseng season in towards the middle of September, but in areas where there's more exposure, we prioritize that first, uh, you know, prioritize going to those areas first. Um, another thing is putting your cameras, not just one game camera, but two uh, game cameras. So like one spacing in another, so that somebody's just not going to be like, well, let me just like go, uh, you know, so that way one camera is pointing to the other and it creates like a little bit more of a deterrent. Um, cause you know, you're on camera already when you're standing there. Um, <laughs> I think that's, that's about it for us. Between, you know, that and just the soil is really rocky and the plants worth digging are pretty spread apart for the most part. So it would be really slow going. It's, you know, it's, I think it's a lot easier to cause major economic damage for a woods grown farm just because the ginseng is so much closer together and the soil might have been tilled. Um, you know, hypothetically, if somebody's coming back repeatedly by that point, hopefully we will have caught them. Yeah. You know, or, but, but I will... it's hard to I don't know. We've been. I will add that we have been in touch with our local police department, so they know what we're doing. Um, so that if there if there are issues, we're going to have a potent, hopefully quicker response than um, we might other otherwise have. We're not trying to hide that we're growing ginseng and hide everything that we're doing. We're making it more obvious, and the first person who does steal our ginseng that we catch will face consequences. What about you guys, Ed and Carol? Unfortunately, we've been robbed. Um, I had some parental uh, gardens that, um, like I said in earlier, you know, I am a buyer. So I select some of the best of the best. And um, I plant those. And unfortunately, you know, with advertising your business, you might throw some pictures out there to boost your business and, you uh, Sometimes the wrong people see that. Uh, we was, uh, I think there was an issue in some local state magazines that got us some attention because not long after that, I lost a bunch. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we, we have the cameras and such, but um, there's always that guy that either gets real lucky or he just had a fantastic day and gets through and gets your stuff and gets... Maybe you see him there and don't get to see his face. Um, you know, the trail cameras are great, but you know, that doesn't put him in jail. And you can't have a camera on every every area. No. Know, every plant. <laughs> so yeah, um, that's that's been uh, one of the ones that sort of, I guess around here, people know how crazy I am, so they don't mess with me a whole lot, <laughs> but. <laughs> You know, there is some that came in that they did mess with us. So, uh, unfortunately, something you have to take in stride. I know Larry took a big loss, too. Um, and if you fight it through the court system, even if you know who it is, they don't have the money to pay you. You know, and that's that's where that double-edged sword of advertisement can get you. And that's just mm -hmm. our little advice from mm -hmm. our experience. It's just heartbreaking if after you spent so much time, you know, planning it with your own hands, you know, on your knees with the double bar and taking pictures of it too. You yeah. know how beautiful it was yeah. and how big the tops was and how big the balls of berries was and mm -hmm. yeah, and mm -hmm. it's but it happens. It does, mm -hmm. you know. I think that's part of the business. I don't think you'll get through it without it. Mm -hmm. If right. you do, you've got big walls around your property. 
<laughs> and lots of guards. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I'll just jump in and say, just for the sake of moving on to some other questions, that this, this is its own topic, really, that uh, in many ways doesn't have uh, a satisfactory answer. So right. what I mean by that is people have often figured out um, how to catch people and even then may not have um, a successful prosecution or the punishment may not mean anything, right? So, exactly. so theft is something that you need to consider. It shouldn't discourage you from growing this plant, right? Put the best foot forward and be have a positive kind of attitude, but don't think that uh, just because you put something out on your woods that there's not a sang digger maybe in your county that knows what it looks like, right? So you just got to kind of keep that in mind um, that there's a lot more people walking around your woods than you might have an idea about. And the one thing I hear about people is, or from people is that once they put up a game camera, they start seeing all kinds of interesting people, including <laughs> neighbors, but some people yes. they don't know walking through their ginseng patches. And mm -hmm. they're curious, like, do they know it's ginseng or not, right? <laughs> kind of stuff. So. So, you know, if you can identify the neighbor, it's good to maybe have a conversation and, and you know, um, how you frame that conversation is going to be up to you and the neighbor. Nonetheless, uh, theft is an issue that you do have to be cognizant of. One of the major things that people do is, as we mentioned, is just to pinch the tops. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move on just to some other good questions that are here. And, and again, we'll kind of work through our group here and then if there are any hanging questions that people really want answered we'll we'll get to those but there are a couple of real quick easy ones that i want to reach out to i see jack Barr has raised this question a couple of times hi jack how you doing long time no see um, he's asking about owl houses and putting owls in the woods um, because of the rodent issue and i do have some experience with that in fact there's a video maybe i'll dig it up when one of our guests are talking here that uh, I shot with friends down at Virginia Tech at Randy and Cliffs years ago because they tried owl houses. And while they were successful in getting owls to roost in the owl houses, um, they didn't notice really any impact on the rodents. Uh, and furthermore, any kind of bait then that they wanted to put out, whether it was organic or just full-blown toxic stuff, um, they were very hesitant to do because they didn't want to poison the owls that might be eating the rodents, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's the challenge we get into. So Jack, the answer is um, people have been trying that. Randy and Cliff in particular are a couple of growers that I know have been trying this for rodent control. And while the owls are, you know, most assuredly doing some damage, they're not doing enough damage, it would seem, to the rodent populations. Um, but it doesn't hurt to try and encourage them to get on your property, right? And it certainly is something to consider before you start putting out, uh, you know, rodenticides and poisons, okay? Um, other questions then that I thought were pretty interesting, um, and I just wanna kind of bring it into the conversation a little bit here, is way back, we had a couple of questions about making berry juice as well as how powdering of the roots is done specifically Ed and Carol. So whoever wants to jump in on the products and how you make the products in a, in a short kind of statement, you know, um, without visuals, feel free to jump in. <laughs> well, uh, the berry juice, I take uh, distilled water and say a quart jar and fill it about uh, halfway with berries and halfway with the water get it nice and full, put it in the refrigerator and let it set for about a month and a half. Take it out and stratify the seeds out of it. You got a nice red colored water from the pulp off the uh, berry. And uh, you can tell by the color when it's actually fermented nice and, and done, but uh, I don't know if it truly ferments. I don't see a whole lot of bubbles off of it, but that's our berry juice in, in, in general. Um, the, the grinding of it just basically goes back to the type of grinder you buy. Uh, I think we got it off Amazon and about 150, 160 bucks, but it has multiple blades and it, it'll take it right down to a nice powder form. And uh, we was actually, I think Bob Bife had told us where to get our grinder from and it, it's been a great little investment for us. You just got a new one. Excellent. Anna, Justin, 
How do you make stuff? Well, I'm, we, I mean, we've used berries personally, mostly mm -hmm. to be honest, our, the you know, other employees and ourselves, we eat the berries and then plant the seeds. Um, you eat too many berries though. Your stomach is like a little churning. <laughs> yeah. What about, do you, you not get the energy? Oh yeah. yeah. Boost of energy Some, for we sure. We had one or two people complain that their hearts were racing. I have no idea how many. Yes. Yes. I mean, you probably ate a few dozen at least, or but, um, maybe 50. <laughs> we just, we mostly get these in the tops and we, you know, before we dry them, we separate the stems from the leaves before we dry them, just dry the leaves mm -hmm. on screens. Um, and the stems now we're tincturing. Um, and I really can't emphasize enough how like strong the flavor is of the stem tincture. It was really surprising. I mean, I guess it shouldn't have been because we chew on stems all the time at work. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, it's a good way to use the stems because the other thing, buyers who are buying leaves often want the, they want the leaves for the tops they don't want the stems right like um yes yeah, so that's something to, to think about is that um i know appalachian sustainable development does have a potential growing market for um like more a wholesale uh ginseng leaf uh harvest and um I think some buyers are specifying how, whether they want individual leaves or, you know, cut and sifted or whole. Um, so that's something to consider before you get into harvesting your leaves, maybe see what your potential market might be looking like. Um, for on our end, we're using the leaves um, in our own tea blends and that's how we like to do it. Um, but every buyer is going to be a little different. We have found something that I thought would be interesting is um, our leaves are, are have about a five to one ratio um, when, when you dry them. And what from from fresh to dry. So yeah. I had never seen any like facts regarding uh, uh, the uh, leaf dry down ratio, just roots in terms of ginseng. But um, when we're looking at just leaves, no stems attached, um, it's going from, from five to one, a five to one ratio. So yeah, I, it, make sure to throw that out there, there for people who are interested. A lot of ginseng plants to make, you know, a very a small, lot. yeah. A lot. They're There's very a lot of ginseng up in, in one pound. Um, I've heard of, of prices all over the place, but maybe anything from 300 to 700 a pound um, for, for leaf harvest, depending also on whether you have an organic or a forest grown certification, um, the price per pound will go up, you know, you know, depending on whether you, you have any certifications, but let's, let's move on to another question. Cause we're. Okay, yeah, I've, got a, I've got a couple of good uh, production questions um, and I'll, I'll kind of chime in with my perspective and then send it around uh, from two different folks. The first question was about, um, is it better to grow multiple forest farm crops or just try to specialize in ginseng? And then another one that's related to production practices is, um, do you ever add additional organic matter such as wood chips since much of my leaf litter is gone by midsummer? I suspect that's due to worms. Um, so let me just say, uh, resilience um, is basically achieved through diversity, right? Uh, so. If the ginseng market falls out or if you grow ginseng as i've experienced on some sites for five six seven years and it seems to be doing just well and then you get a wet year and it's gone um what then right so generally speaking it's a good idea to kind of not put all your eggs in one basket with forest farm crops just like you would in a diversified vegetable operation or herb operation okay uh, and so well, oftentimes I can add to that something I touched on, which is that it just turns out that many of the so-called indicators that we look for, things like golden seal and cohoshes and things, are themselves interesting crops that we might want to grow and manage. And so it's a good idea to think about this idea of polyculture, right? That it's not about specializing in ginseng most of the time. Some people do it, but especially if you're a small forest farmer just trying to get into this and see what you can make out of it, I would suggest that you diversify. Now, the other part to that, my response is regarding organic matter. I used to, in my own operations in Western Pennsylvania, add lots of leaf matter, lots of organic matter. 
And then I realized that I was just creating a lot of work for myself and about 50% of the time, more headaches for myself. And so uh, the experience has been that the more that you bulk up the soil with a bunch of organic matter, the more attractive it is for voles in particular. Voles will make their little runs through those areas. They'll feed on the roots. And uh, I literally have pictures of the tops of ginseng plants sitting flush on the ground if you're looking down at them because the, the voles had climbed through there, made their runs and basically chewed the roots up and dropped the tops down into those holes. Um, and so the more you kind of tinker with the soil, the more you start to figure out all these native things that I mentioned that we often say, hey, wonderful wildlife, right? Yeah, great, until you, all that wildlife starts eating your roots. Um, and so when you start to bulk up the soil, my experience has been that you're often inviting problems. And on top of that, um, you're not necessarily creating less work for yourself, you're creating more. So my suggestion is to pick out a good site with good soils first and only use wood chips and leaf mulches and things of that nature if you absolutely need to or if you're just experimenting on your own to see what happens. Um, I'll turn it over to Anna and see what you guys think. I think we completely agree with what you just said. Um, I never actually heard uh, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, adding leaf litter and increased vole predation. That got me thinking, I've, I've never thought about that before, but I, the, the one area where we had quite a bit of vole predation was kind of at the bottom of a slope where we had a really good leaf litter. <laughs> yep. so maybe there's a correlation there now i'm learning something too today <laughs> we were hoping that our really rocky soil would uh you know prevent a lot of vole damage but it doesn't seem it doesn't seem to actually have my i mean it, it's hard to say without comparing but there's plenty of vole damage even if the soil is like one part dirt to three parts rocks so <laughs> Yeah, that being said, I, we haven't seen a, a great amount of vole damage. It's like in certain areas, but then there are other areas that are untouched. And I, I can't say that I can think of a correlation in terms of leaf litter or anything like that in that regard. Um, we, we never add any uh, extra leaf litter or wood chips to any of our plantings. So we're trying to just mimic what would be there naturally, yeah. you know, and just use what's on site if possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, always. Ed, Carol, what about mm -hmm. you all? I know, you, I think you mentioned to me in the past that you've had some rodent issues. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's pretty much inevitable. <laughs> the, the ginseng root, uh, I think every, everything likes it. The deer even eat, you know, if they paw it out, they'll nibble it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we've had issues with rodents. I haven't found the, the true trick to that yet. I wish I did. I think you'd make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. So you don't do any kind of organic amendments? Uh, well, the best organic amendment that we have, we've got a couple of black snakes that lay on a rock wall that sort of swallow one or two every once in a while. So that's about <laughs> as organic as we are. <laughs> Katie, I see you have an announcement up here, yes. Yeah, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up and just let everybody know the closing details, but I see there are still a number of questions in the Q&A feature. And so if folks wanna stick around, I know Eric will probably stay on for 15 or so minutes to see if, how many questions we can answer. And Anna, Justin, Ed, Carol, if y'all are also up for hanging out, we can um, try to get some of those questions answered. But before we do that, we want to let you know that there's one more webinar coming up April 14th focused on Golden Seal and other NTFPs. And we also wanted to invite you to connect with the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition if you're not already looped in to our offerings and our coalition. So you can find us on social media. We have Facebook, Instagram, and Forest Farming. You can find all that on the Appalachian Forest Farmers website. And Stesha will be putting that in the chat. Also, we invite you to provide feedback on the session tonight. We have a short survey. We'd love to hear from you and see if you have suggestions and what you got from this event tonight. And finally, we just want to send a big thank you to all of our speakers tonight, Eric, Ed, Carol, Anna, 
Justin, thank you all so much for sharing your expertise and the dynamic conversation and just the years of experience that you're bringing to share with our community today. It's we're, we're very grateful to have you here today. And there are a few folks in the background I just want to mention, Stesha Warren and Janine Davis, who are supporting with tech and making sure everybody can get onto the session tonight. So just want to thank them as well. And with that, Eric, I'll pass it back on to you if you'd like to continue with the questions. Yeah, so we'll, we'll uh, hang out. It's uh, 730. And uh, if you all want to jump off, as some people have already done, feel free to, but we're willing to stick around for about 15 minutes here and just kind of chip away at some of these questions that are coming in. Uh, in the interest of time, and so that we can diversify the responses, I'm going to try and aggregate some of the questions that are, uh, that are some good juicy questions that we want to hear from our producers from. Okay. Uh, so some of these things are more targeted. They're great questions. For example, I'm seeing how much of leaf sales is dried versus fresh. Uh, great question, but some of this stuff is very kind of dependent, right, on markets. And some of those markets change from year to year and producer to producer. And so uh, some of the other things that are popping up that have to do more with kind of advanced production. Uh, Julie's asking about battling invasive species, for example, Japanese stiltgrass, which is one of my arch nemesis because it's this delicate little annual that is just so easy to pull but once it gets going on forest lands it's just terrible right and um, so uh, my approach is to try and deal with them right out of the gate um, and the first thing that I do is just try and get rid of the shrubs primarily because the shrubs are probably the easiest target in my opinion um, it's when we get into some of the herbaceous plants like stiltgrass, uh, which can actually come in following removal of the shrubs, ironically, um, that we get into some tricky territory. So I'll just kind of put it over to you, Anna. Uh, invasives is a problem in New York. And what are you doing about it? Anything? So here's one of the big problems. In order to boost your ginseng's growth rate and, you know, we like to mimic natural disturbances, as we mentioned, by doing some canopy thinning. And, but bringing in that extra light, stilt grass mm -hmm. loves that, along with a number of other invasives. So it's kind of, you know, you're, you, it's almost better to keep it really shady because a number of invasives prefer that extra light. But then if you've already so. got stilt grass, like, right, if it's in already some on spots, you know, and on properties where we don't have any stilt grass, we don't worry about it. No, generally, it, part of site preparation involves removing all shrubby invasive species, barberry, um, you know, honeysuckle. honeysuckle. Buckthorn, we do yep. a lot of buckthorn remover, removal. Yeah, and it'll, you know, it might slowly come back over the years, but we do such a, you know, clean removal of it that you're talking like 10, 15 years before it really starts becoming a potential problem again. But otherwise, you know, we don't, we haven't found a good way to deal with some of the herbaceous ones like stilt grass and our field production mugwort is our worst nightmare and we've not found an effective way to deal with it unfortunately mm -hmm. um, so so it sounds like it's just a continuous kind of ongoing thing that you're you're you before you yeah. prep kind of like i shared with randy and cliff they come in they prep the site initially but then you kind of put it on cruise control and do what you can Yep. Yeah, definitely. And that's, and that's when we do the majority of our canopy thinning as well. Where, when, when we're talking about canopy thinning, we're talking about doing, it's kind of like TSI. We're taking out uh, mostly like uh, smaller trees and creating gaps that are fairly small, um, but sort of all over the place so that right. there's a, the ambient light is, is higher than it otherwise would be. And these are trees that we're not going to make it anyway, generally. I mean, we've also have done some girdling in sites in order to leave snags, um, uh, you know, which has its own environmental benefits, but you have some danger to that in the future. For then the when you go harvest. back to harvest your ginseng, you have to be wary. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I'll just say a little PSA for folks. Um, taking down trees when you have an established canopy if you're not good with a chainsaw or you mm -hmm. haven't been trained properly, uh, don't do it, okay? That's how people get injured or die. And I had a colleague uh, just this past year, uh, got a tree hung up. He, he literally 
taught chainsaw safety with me in many <laughs> workshops and was doing the number one no-no, which is working by yourself with a chainsaw in the woods, trying to take down canopy trees that often get hung up and you just don't know which way they're going to fall. And so you want to be careful. Uh, managing the canopy is an important part of this, but definitely don't just buy yourself a chainsaw at Lowe's and start going out and start cutting things down. <laughs> that said, Ed, Carol, um, how about you folks? We don't really have too many invasives that take other than the ferns. Yeah, ferns. We, we have a lot of fern on our property, which I think stunts the growth just from what my personal experience is watching the, the, the ginseng grow. I know they're very old and to have a plant that's six inches tall mm -hmm. where, where the ferns aren't, you're seeing knee high plants. It, there's different, different things, but we let it go. I mean, we're not mm -hmm. going to fight it. Um, we've got hardwoods, we've got maples and beech, and we really don't have an issue with the mm -hmm. under, understory of invasives. No, Great. We're, we're fortunate there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You want to add it to my hasten your ferns? Yeah, I will say we do avoid planting areas with a lot of hay scented fern, um, where, because that can really kind of take over in a carpet on the ground in a way that some of our other fern species tend to be like in their little clumps um it's scattered here and there like spinulose wood ferns yeah dryopteris like ginseng we've seen does amazingly hiding among those fern clumps but hay scented fern we've we've also observed it stunting ginseng we just don't plant in hay scented fern yeah we mm -hmm. we just skip right over it when we're planting mm -hmm. um now, let me amend what I said. It stunts the plant, but I think my roots get bigger. Interesting. <laughs> huh. The nice. energy goes to the root. Huh. We're going to have to check that out and yeah. see whether we see the same thing and let you know. Uh, there's, there's a couple of questions I'm just going to quickly respond to that just seeking clarification in particular. So a couple of people have asked about, well, how do you know when the bud is set on that rhizome and when the seeds are mature. And uh, sorry about that, if that's not clear, uh, but basically it's pretty telltale. So seeds are mature when the berries turn red. Okay, so seeds are mature when the berries turn red. Uh, in terms of the buds, uh, essentially you have to learn either through pictures or online or best yet uh, through a workshop where someone can show you a root. Um, what the bud looks like on the end of the rhizome, but it's pretty obvious. Once you start, start to see some ginseng roots, you're going to see a, a little swollen bud. Um, and, you know, if we weren't at the end of this, I could search through my pictures and pull one up for you. But um, if you're still not sure what I'm talking about, feel free to reach out to me and I can show you, send you a picture and you can see what I'm talking about. But buds are fairly obvious when they're formed uh, and it's typically in late summer. And as I mentioned earlier, in Pennsylvania, we typically are looking at about early August, whenever the buds are formed. Yeah, I have a, a root right here, a dried root. And awesome. these, these two sort of white spots on the tip of the root. So the stem had been right here. This is the very top of the plant. And there's actually two buds that, was on, that were on this plant when I harvested it. And now they're kind of dried up, but there'll be a swollen white, uh like like little uh ball on the end of the on the very uh tip of the, of the root neck, the of the of the on the neck it's really that obvious makes sense. <laughs> you, you don't have to dig far down you i mean it depends on the plant but it's really obvious it stands out it's the bud when it's the apical bud when it's out excellent thank you for that um another question that kind of peppered in throughout that i'll just start out by saying see if there's any other input on this is people were asking about well my site is like this and it's it's not quite what you described now what i started out by talking about is kind of the cliff notes right so very very quick kind of snapshot in site evaluation um, as i mentioned there is there is a a number of resources out there including some scientific papers on site evaluation but there's also some extension resources our friend bob bifus has a site evaluation uh, sheet that is contained in janine davis's and scott person's book um, that assesses a variety of things everything from aspect down to the security 
Um, so there's a lot of resources out there I would encourage you to take a look at because we can't possibly capture in a short little session like this the diversity of indicator species that you might see across Appalachia at higher elevations, lower elevations, uh, toe slope on west slope versus a north slope, all those sorts of things. But what I've tried to lay out to you is some general impressions that you're going to look for indicator species. Those are the cheapest and most reliable way to kind of get a sense. They're kind of a long-term barometer of what are the habitat conditions of that site. Um, you know, a tulip poplar or a sugar maple has taken decades to grow into a canopy tree. The fact that it survived there tells you something about the site, right? And if you marry that then with understory species that also are growing and surviving, and just like ginseng are these long-lived perennial species that are shade obligate, then you, you have something. Uh, and so, as I mentioned in, in the webinar, you you generally want to start to pay attention to what people are reporting, both in the scientific or extension literature, other ginseng growers or diggers, um, about in your region, which are the typical species that you wanna look for. And I will dare say that you can, with a little bit of TLC and good energy, I've seen people make ginseng grow just about anywhere. Now that is different from establishing a patch that's going to thrive and spread on its own, which is ideally what we want to do. But, you know, for example, here at my own home, I've got plenty of ginseng plants that I've got tucked in into little garden spaces, just so I can keep an eye on when they come up and all that sort of stuff. And most sand growers that I know of and diggers have the same sort of thing going on where they've got little pet plants around the landscape. So you can get ginseng to grow like many ornamentals in many areas. But what we're trying to lay out is if you want this thing to spread on its own and to reproduce and produce seeds and berries that you can replant in an area, then you need to invest in learning where ginseng is gonna grow on your property, all right? And there's no 100% rule about that in terms of elevation, for example. In Pennsylvania, as I shared, our elevation goes from down near sea level outside of Philadelphia to up over 3,000 feet down in the Laurel Highlands, okay? And so ginseng grows throughout the state at a variety of elevations. It's just, you look for the sweet spots within those areas and those sweet spots are identified by indicator species. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did you all have something to add to that? I just wanted to say uh, for the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic, Justin actually wrote a field guide to identifying ginseng habitat. And when you look through the field guide in the different species um, that he has in there, it'll say like poor indicator, primary indicator. So you can use this when you're in a habitat that uh, is likely ginseng habitat to go through. And, and that's available on our website. So. Or lucid.com. Thank you for plugging that. That's a fantastic resource that Justin has put together. So, and it's fairly inexpensive, is that right? Like, yeah, hundred dollar books. No, mm -hmm. it's like twenty. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, that's that's that. Anything you all want to contribute, Ed Carroll? Your experience We're good. with science? Okay. So, um, I often encourage people to you know look for indicators, but don't be afraid of trying to establish a patch, right? Just like any other garden crop that you would try and play with, you know, give it an experiment, see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, but just be clear about, you know, what is a good site and what's a questionable site, right? As you're doing that, okay. Um, other things that I see in our remaining time is there was a lot of questions about ginsenocides in here. Like, do they vary in the leaf content during the season? Uh, does the soil conditions influence the ginsenoside content of the roots and so on? And what I'll say is that uh, the research is pretty extensive on ginsenocides at this point, at least in, in, in the broad perspective, because there is an industry around this, as well as a culture on the other side of the planet that's been studying this plant like crazy, um, chemistry-wise, for decades. And what we know is that ginsenocides are, first of all, not just one compound, but over 120 different compounds that are found in the plant. And that ginsenocides do vary according to many, many different kinds of features, everything from the plant age to the stress that it's under. Um, what we don't know 
And the question I've been trying to get some funding to do is to look at that question of, does the leaf composition change over time? Uh, and we don't know the answer to that. Uh, the markets, however, I will note, have wanted nice, fresh, green material. And so what that means is people have generally been harvesting from June through August, again, not clipping entire tops, but just removing few leaflets at a time at any given stage so that they can maintain that nice, fresh lime green leaf material rather than old brown insect eaten kind of stuff, right? So uh, we really don't know the answer to whether the ginsenicides vary over the season, but I suspect that they do based on the work that we and other folks do around the phytochemistry of these Appalachian plants, which suggests that when these plants go to flower, and golden seal is a great example of this, they often concentrate these secondary metabolites. And we believe that's because they're trying to defend those reproductive organs. So there's a good chance that ginseng at flowering time actually has a larger array or a stronger complement of ginsenosides, but that's just conjecture without any science behind it at the moment. But we do know that ginsenosides vary according to a variety of different characteristics, everything from when you harvest it to how old the plant is to how stressed out it is in under growing conditions. All right, I think um, for everybody's sake, we'll wind it down right around here, Katie. Um, and if anybody has any real burning questions, of course, you have contact for us uh, and you can feel free to reach out to any of us or all of us and we'll be happy to kind of direct you to resources or answer it the best that we can. Great. Thanks so much, Eric. Thanks, Anna, Justin, Ed, Carol. And thank you all for coming to join us today, sharing your evening with us. Again, we'll have this recording available and up on our website next week, and we'll have it captioned as well. So that'll be available um, in our archives. And we hope that you revisit it and share it with others as well. So thank you all so much. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you all talking about this very special plant. Thanks for having us. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks, everybody. Hey, see y'all later.